Hello everybody, in today's episode, another instalment of what I'm going to call the Automotive Atonement of JM on Cars, where I visit all of the vehicles that I mercilessly thrashed as a kid and a teenager without having any actual experience of them. And of course, chief amongst cars that any British youngster will bash is everything American. And so today, I am driving an example of America's sports car, the C5 generation Corvette Z06. that, like a lot of British people, as a youngster, there was nothing worse than the idea of a Corvette. After all, everybody had told me they were poorly made, plasticky things with lazy engines and old-fashioned technology from a backwards country that wouldn't know a corner if it bit it in the rear end. However, when you begin to look at something like this C5, you realise in very many ways it was quite ahead of its time. This generation Corvette landed in 1996 and went through to 2004. It has a features list that even now is still pretty decent. So we have dual zone climate control. You could option Magri dampers. There is a heads up display. It has a very trick suspension with double wishbone front and rear, but at the back, a fiber reinforced plastic leaf spring that takes the place of conventional coils, giving the car a little bit more boot space. A setup that was clever enough, even Lotus said it was a pretty good idea. The construction of the C5 was also highly innovative. Like previous generations of Corvette, the body was largely composite, however the chassis was all new. The engineers behind the project took a massive gamble with the C5. General Motors was not in good health, so the original $250 million engineering budget had been slashed to just $150 million. Even at the time, a mid-engined Corvette was being considered, as was the possibility of saving a fortune by simply re-engineering the older C4. However, Corvette's chief engineer, Dave Hill, had a vision. He proposed a radical new chassis featuring hydroformed steel to create a platform onto which the new body could be attached. Problem was, that was expensive. Chevrolet general manager Jim Perkins could see the validity of this design, so took $1.2 million of the design budget and assigned it to build a prototype car with which to convince GM's management. It worked. The C5 Corvette became the first car ever to have a major structural component made by hydroforming. It was also the first Corvette with a transaxle layout, placing the gearbox at the rear of the car for better weight distribution. The improvement was tangible. This new car was not just lighter, but also five times stiffer than the old one, which translated into huge gains across the board. This performance oriented version of the car, the Z06, replaced the outgoing C4 ZR1 and provided performance comparable to many sports and supercars of the day, like the Aston Martin DB7 and the Ferrari 355. I have in fact just hopped out of a Lamborghini Gallardo Superleggera, and believe it or not, this lump of old American pig iron is actually lighter by quite a bit. This tips the scales real world at 1430 kilos which is not bad. The regular cars had the option of your typical American slushy matic gearbox, but the Z06 came only with this beautiful six-speed manual. It has shorter ratios than the regular car, and elsewhere, a lot of real engineering work has been done to ensure this is no normal Corvette with a couple of extra ponies. The regular car is available in three different body styles, a convertible, which for the first time in Corvette history had an opening boot. Yes, I know, that is the sort of thing that makes us Europeans mock the Americans, isn't it? There was also the familiar coupe, or more accurately, target top car, and then there was the fixed roof coupe, which is a bit of an odd looking duck because it appears as if someone's taken the hard top from a convertible and kind of bonded it on. It was that chassis that provided the basis for the Z06 because it was the stiffest of them all. Up front, instead of the regular LS1 engine that you got in the normal Corvette, you have an LS6. 
both are 5.7 litres in displacement and yes, are still cam in block, which again, us Europeans like to mock. However, what this does is mean that the engine is very compact, giving the car an impossibly low bonnet line. You really do feel like you're scraping along the ground in this thing. It's fantastic. Though there are fundamental similarities between the LS1 and the LS6, there are also quite a few differences. So this has different valve train, it's got different cams in it, it has different intake and a different exhaust. In fact, this is the world's first application of a titanium exhaust on a standard car, and it sounds pretty damn good. The regular Corvette made 345 horsepower, the early 2001 Z06 made 385, but this, the 2002 and onwards, make 405. Torque is 400 pound-feet, that's around 540 newton meters. This car has been brought to me by a lovely young chap called Alfred, who's just 23 and used to have an Alfa Romeo Giulia. He also currently has a first-generation Mazda MX-5, and in some ways this is the spiritual successor to that, because he wanted something that was still fun and sporty, but had a little bit more drama, was a little bit more grown up and fast, but also a touch more refined and comfortable for longer journeys. One of his dream cars is an Aston Martin V12 Vantage, and he saw this as very much a stepping stone to that. I kind of see where he's coming from, very much the same thing. Two-seater, really generous boot in this thing as well, absolutely massive if somewhat oddly shaped. He's actually got whole engines in there before. It gives you that low-slung, sporty driving position, and certainly here in Britain, a Corvette is something very different. Handily for him, the insurance is also dirt cheap. Even as a 23-year-old, it's actually cheaper than his Alfa Romeo Giulia was. You may be led to believe that anything with a 5.7-litre V8 in it is going to be thirsty. However, the Corvette has always been pretty good in terms of fuel economy. This, across mixed driving, by a 23-year-old that's enjoying having a V8, still gets over 23 to the gallon. To put that into some context, that's about the same as you'd get from an E46 M3. I'm not sure what the prices of these are like in America, but here you can pick up a car much like this for between 20 and 25,000 pounds, which means they're not actually all that much more expensive than a regular C5. So, let's see what America's sports car can do on Britain's roads. really put a smile on this grumpy old face, I can tell you. This is incredible. The last old Corvette I drove was a C4 convertible, which is a very, very different thing. Though in theory that was the generation that predated this, the C4 lasted an awful long time. It had a 13-year production run, which really is about twice as long as many other European cars get. So by the time it was going off sale, it was already a very, very old car. That old C4, sure, I was driving probably the least sporty variant, was just a lovely car to bimble down the road, listen to the noise of, and just kind of enjoy the fact you were out in something unusual. Whereas this, you can really take for a drive, and it loves it. The gearbox is a little bit reluctant on occasion, a touch too notchy, but I'm told can be improved quite easily. Impressively, for a cam in block overhead valve engine, peak power is at 6,000 and peak torque, surprisingly high, at 4,800. Overall grip levels are fairly decent. When you do begin to push and the car washes a little wide, it tends to at the rear first, but I think that's because this car has slightly older rubber on it. It's fairly progressive though, pretty easy to predict, and the car does telegraph its intentions to you very clearly. to mock the 
Corvette suspension, chiefly because it has a leaf spring in it. Even that is actually a very clever implementation and the rest of it is still double wishbone all round, meaning that even this stiffly set up Z06 is actually still fairly compliant and when you get on it, pretty enjoyable. Body control is still decent and any sort of idea you might have had of American cars being big, soft, wallowy, lovely in a straight and useless in a bend are very, very quickly put to bed. One thing you have to watch out for with this specific car is that somebody has fitted a front air dam to it and over certain sections that aren't even that rough, it can and will tap the ground. I'm actually not at all intimidated by the fact I'm on the wrong side of the car. Visibility is generally pretty good. The rear three quarters over there is a little bit sketchy. Coming out at a junction, I think you will have to position the car in a very specific way, but this feels fantastic. Now, I'm sure some of you will have seen a few other shots of the interior and maybe had a little bit of a chuckle. Believe me, nobody here is under any illusion the interior is anything beyond, well, a little bit of a joke really. This is very typical 1980s, 1990s American vinyl-tastic stuff that's just a little bit embarrassing. But there are some very good things about it. These seats, though not particularly sportive and rather garish, are actually supremely comfortable. I would say they're doing a very good job of isolating me from some of the imperfections in the road. You can tell the car suspension is struggling just a touch with some of that. The steering wheel, again, bit of an odd looking shape, not very sexy, but is really nice in the hand, actually has some decent weighting and communication coming through it, and I really like. This gear lever here is a touch silly. It's a big old cube of a thing that feels like it should be in an old Carlton rather than a Corvette, but hey, who cares, it still works, and I'm sure you can get an aftermarket one if you so desire. In fact, one of the very best bits about American sports cars is that even though this has been out of production for now some 18 years, you can still get bits for them, easily and cheaply. We mock Americans for the way they do things, but you know what? Sometimes I think they've been doing it the right way. You buy a 20-year-old Italian sports car and you may find there's a lot of stuff you just can't get. like this no problem loads of bits are available both OE and aftermarket you can improve the performance alter the handling the styling anything you want to do all the pieces are still very very easy to get a hold of which is fantastic it does feel like there's absolutely nothing protecting the bottom of the chassis and when the stones hit the underside of the car it makes an awful racket but again I've been told don't worry about it dashboard is pretty cool, very funky to look at. It's got a stack of options up here so you can get all sorts of stuff on the trip computer, lots of very helpful information. Oh, engine pulls really nicely from low down. Clutch, very easy. I have been warned, if you drive this car particularly hard, the biting point of the clutch can change. I haven't experienced that, but apparently it's a Corvette thing. Don't even need to rev it out from 200,000 RPM, plenty of poke. It's not a big car either. We placed it next to the Lambo earlier, which is already fairly small in its footprint, and this is really quite compact. Compared to the Audi e-tron GT I've been driving this week, it's, um, well, minuscule. It's such a good noise. I'm also very grateful for these shorter gear ratios. A lot of performance cars have just far too long a gearing, particularly more modern ones. I think that's an emissions thing. And it does make my life difficult on occasion because I know you want to hear what this engine sounds like when I rev it out. And I don't want to have to do 100 mile an hour to do that for fairly obvious reasons. Let's give you a bit of second, shall we? Whoa, what a performer. Turning really nice. Grip level's very good. Plenty of confidence in the thing. The dampers here are passive items. On the Z06, I don't think you could get the mag ride options. Rather misleadingly, down here you have a button that says active handling. What that actually is, is a traction control setting. I'm going to leave that as it is for now. Because to be honest, the car's really not stopping me from having fun. Oh, brakes are fantastic. Maybe a little heavily servo for my liking. Very, very good. Oh, 
what a machine! The sole mechanical modification to this car of any real note is the fitment of a k and air filter. But in this car, it actually sits at the front right by the air intake. So it's probably one of the few times a k and system actually is a cold air intake and is probably doing something actually helpful. Failing that may just be giving you a bit more noise and it's not really a bad thing. This exhaust is perfectly judged. I am told on longer motorway journeys, cabin noise can be something of an issue, and I can kind of get that. There should be a little divider between the cabin and the boot, but that got smashed by the head from an engine that sort of broke loose and went through the middle. I think that's the reason it's a little bit boomy and noisy in here, because like a 911, your rear wheel arch is essentially in with you. Sure, some of the gaps in here are hilarious. I could lose an entire limb down here. The door over there and the dash are about a foot apart from one another. And uh, yeah, it's not exactly high class. This is not Alcantara up here, I think. But you know what? It feels just fine. I really can't mock it that much. Especially when this is a car that has a heads-up display, a feature that the 20-year newer £140,000 Audi e-tron I'm driving doesn't have. The aircon is also excellent, though perhaps not surprising. Americans do need decent aircon. The country is quite warm on occasion. The cup holder down here is absolutely useless for anything other than McDonald's basic cups. This armrest. <laughs> I've got to mention the armrest. I mean, what the hell? It looks like somebody ate a checkered flag and then threw up. The door handle here appears to already be separating from the rest of the door and is the cheapest, nastiest plastic you can imagine. The seat belts in this car are also very unusual. They look like the sort of ones you get fitted to a car that didn't have them originally. Not sure what Chevrolet were thinking there. And not forgetting the true pièce de résistance, a feature I would love to say is unique to this car, but I fear isn't. At the front, somebody has installed a set of trolley wheels presumably to try and preserve the front end, but at the cost of your dignity. And I have to be honest, as Corvettes go, I don't think this is much of a looker. The way they've kind of grafted this roof onto it just looks very, very haphazard. But, you know what? I'm not sure I really care, because when it comes down to it, this is a car I actually really like driving. And for your money, for 20 odd thousand pounds, yeah, sure, you could have any one of a number of Euro boxes, but this is something quite different. I expect in America they're probably viewed in a very, very different way, either positive or negative, I'm really not sure. If you happen to be watching this and you are a subject of Uncle Sam, why don't you tell us how you see the C5 and in particular the Z06? Is this cult classic or a Beverly Hillbillies Ferrari? Please tell me. I know one person that would really, really love this car, and that's my friend Laurie. Now, I know he prefers the C4, but there is one thing the Corvette C5 can lay claim to, because on the 2nd of July 2004, when this went out of production, so did the pop-up headlamp. Yep, this and the Lotus Esprit were the last two cars to have one, and this was the final one to roll off the production line. And they are quite cool pop-ups. If anything, this car coming towards you with the headlights up, it does cut a very similar figure to an FD generation Mazda RX-7. In fact, one of the reasons that the Chevrolet LS is such a popular engine to swap in just about anything, RX-7s included, is that it is so compact, particularly for the power it puts out. So for a car like an RX-7, which also has a very low bonnet line, the LS will fit. These are also cars designed to be fairly cheap, easy to maintain and service. Sure, stuff might go wrong or fall off, whatever, but it's unlikely to be anything that big or expensive. Alfred hasn't had this car for all that long, but the only issue he's experienced thus far is a faulty fuel sender, which means on occasion it thinks the car has no fuel left when it does. My changing attitudes towards the Corvette began really with the C7. I saw that car and thought, wow, that is a looker. Then I got to drive one and really, really loved it. I also have some very special and fond memories of a few trips I had in a C7. I am now, slowly but surely, working my way through the back catalogue of Corvettes and I'm very happy to say that I have found quite a few others that I also seem to really like. And you know something, I think this C5 Z06 is going to go down 
as one of my favourites. It really is just a crying shame that it's taken until now for Chevrolet to try and make this in right-hand drive in any significant numbers. I don't actually think this being left-hand drive is anywhere near as much of an issue as it is with the C7. That car is really compromised. This, I think I could just about get away with. The later car, no. It's tricky even in America. So then, the C3, the C4, they're cars that I've enjoyed in a kind of weird, it's fun because it's old and different and makes a nice noise, retro sort of way. But the C5, I love driving. I'll tell you something, I'm as surprised as anyone. So, all that remains for me to say then is a sorry to all of the Corvette fans out there whom I've needlessly bashed for so many years. A big thank you to Alfred for bringing his car out and of course to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already and even if you have, don't forget to hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of every new upcoming video. See you for the next one. Bye bye.